In January 2015, the first State of the Bay Research Symposium was held at the Alaska Ferry Terminal on Bellingham Bay. The purpose of the all-day event was to enhance communication and coordination between various agencies, organizations, and citizens involved in the protection of Bellingham Bay. The symposium brought together researchers, managers, and interested citizens who are all connected to the future of the Bay. The symposium featured seven distinct topics, including Bellingham Bay yesterday and today, local key issues, challenges, and research needs, physical processes, chemistry and water quality, biological ecosystems, regional research perspectives, and moving forward with limited funding. We will present the State of the Bay Symposium in seven parts. This is part six, regional research perspectives. So uh, our next speaker is Ken Zinbaugh, and he's the senior monitoring program coordinator for the Puget Sound Partnership. There's always one speaker who won't send you their bio. Ken's that guy for us today. So when he gets up, he'll tell you a little more about what he does for the Puget Sound Partnership and his presentation today on uh, the regional perspective on uh, region, uh, Puget Sound ecosystems and our monitoring gaps. So Ken. Hi, thanks. Um, yeah, I didn't really want to send the bio. I was kind of afraid to start talking about how many decades I've been doing this and how great my hair was. and. Enough of that today already. Um, I just want to thank everybody um, for coming here and, and for the invitation and certainly to the, to the Lummi Nation um, for hosting us. Um, so I'm going to talk about a couple things today. I was asked to uh, talk a little bit about just, you know, what is this organization uh, that we're calling the Puget Sound Ecosystem Monitoring Program? What is, you know, who are we and what are we doing? I was asked to talk a little bit about the work that we really engaged in over the past year and a half or, or maybe longer developing monitoring inventory and a gap analysis. And there's been quite a bit of discussions in the presentations this morning and early this afternoon around um, monitoring gaps and data needs that um, folks here are still feeling to better understand the system locally. And then if, uh, if I have a little time and can get into it, I, I want to talk a little bit about the vital signs that we're reporting and um, kind of show how we can put them to some extent into a regional context and how Bellingham Bay and this part of the Sound compares to other locations in Puget Sound. So um, there's a little bit of the sort of the organizational bureaucratic junk up front and I'll try to you know work through that as quick as I can and uh, the fun stuff, the data is at the back. So um, just a little context, uh, I, uh, I actually, my employer is actually the Puget Sound Partnership, although I, I work on behalf of the Puget Sound Ecosystem Monitoring Program. Partnership, you all know, was created in 2007 with these goals to coordinate efforts to restore Puget Sound, uh, to lead the science and the recovery planning effort and to set priorities for recovery, and then to provide some sort of tracking accountability and reporting functions. Uh, keep in mind the partnership has no regulatory authority of its own. It relies on its members and partners to, you know, to affect most of the recovery actions, and it's, uh, they're sort of in this backbone structure um, to provide some support. So it, one of the things that the partnership has done is it produced this action agenda, which is the document that is, serves as the planning guide for restoration recovery of Puget Sound. Uh, the science panel has actually produced this biennial science work plan. They've updated it at least once now, um, which is really supposed to describe the priority science needs uh, in order to affect the recovery of Puget Sound. Uh, the partnership also produces the State of the Sound report, and the PSEMP members um, contribute heavily to this report. Um, so, you know, really what I want to show is, you know, that's the partnership's overall goals. What PSEMP does, really, is it is attempting to help coordinate the monitoring efforts uh, resulting, you know, related to the restoration, and to really help provide this tracking and reporting function. Um, and, you know, just again, the bureaucratic stuff, we actually have a charter. It was adopted by the Leadership Council in 2011. And the, and the focus of the organization is to coordinate monitoring and build on partnerships. Uh, the meeting today really exemplifies the goals of PSEM generally in trying to bring people from diverse organizations together to integrate information and data sets across topics and across objectives, and then to try to tease out of that sort of the bigger picture of what's going on overall. 
Um, we, we hope we contribute to building a monitoring framework that does support the action agenda, the recovery goals that we all share, and, um, and again, this reporting process to evaluate progress towards that recovery. Uh, PSEMP actually kind of lives inside this, this governance cloud around Puget Sound, but uh, it doesn't have direct line authority underneath any one of those entities. So uh, we, we connect with and coordinate with the science panel, the ECB, the Salmon Recovery Council, Leadership Council, and so forth, but um, th we, we are not in a directed relationship to any of them. Uh, the basic organization, we have a steering committee of about 23 different members and organizations. And then there's this uh, cloud of, of technical work groups that are topic-based. Uh, right now we have about 12 work groups. Some are very active, some are less active. Um, but overall, it, it spans most of the um, components of the ecosystem. So the steering committee members, uh, as of you know this month at least, we've got 23 different organizations involved on the steering committee. I do want to mention, because it's been brought up a couple times, the invitation to please invite the tribes to come to the meetings and sit with us. Uh, the Lummi tribe has certainly been there from the very beginning. In fact, uh, Alan Chapman deserves probably the award for individual who attends more meetings than anybody else in the world. Um, <laughs> Uh, we also have the Nisqually Tribe and Northwest Indian Fish Commission, and as you can see, kind of a whole host of organizations that span federal and state agencies, local governments, watershed-based groups, um, NGOs, business, so forth. So that's the attempt is to capture the experience and the objectives and interests of all those organizations. Um, all together right now, if you sort of look at the sort of the mailing list across the 12 different work groups, actually we're, we're probably closer to about 400 people that um, are involved with or at least follow or track the work that we're doing through PSEMP. We, we actually have um, at least 200 active members and, and the definition I'm placing on active is that they attend at least half of the meetings that we call, they contribute, they respond to emails and so forth. So that's pretty remarkable. Um, you know, because I go back decades, I remember back in the early and mid 80s, uh, in the early days of the Puget Sound Ambient Monitoring Program, when, um, you know, we'd be gratified if we had like eight people around the table. And so this is a big change and it reflects really the growing interest and um, uh, I think the premium people put on partnerships now. So, so again, what, what is the Puget Sound Ecosystem Monitoring Program? It's really this collaborative network of monitoring agencies and organizations that span uh, monitoring interests, uh, across all these different topic areas across the ecosystem. Uh, the basic business model is the, those agencies and organizations, um, they're the ones who are tasked with conducting monitoring and, and, and managing their own funding, aligned with their own statutory mandates. The partnership um, does not directly fund or conduct any monitoring of any note. So this is not something where, we, where we've got the boots on the ground or the boats in the water. Department of Ecology does their monitoring. Uh, you know, Whatcom County or the Nooksack watershed folks are doing their monitoring. We're trying to help connect those partners together and, and help form common objectives and streamline some of that process, but we're not driving the, the monitoring uh, per se. EPA provides my funding and the funding for the staff that supports the work groups. Um, and we operate really just through collaboration, coordination, and persuasion to the extent that we're able to. Um, and the focus really is on, is on sharing results and building partnerships. Again, um, this meeting is a great example of, of how that can be done and, um, and then forming these collaborations and coordinations. The scope, of course, is Puget Sound, uh, and we put that in the context of the whole Salish Sea. And actually, this shaded area is even a little bit incorrect, as Christopher and others have pointed out. Uh, we actually have to think about the ocean boundary conditions and what that imports um, from that side of the system as well. So it's a pretty big watershed overall. You know, two different countries, numerable um, governmental um, entities. The introduction this morning pointed out just how many different organizations and agencies are involved with managing small footprints in the edges of Bellingham Bay here. And so when you expand that out to the whole area, um, it's, it's a big system and it's very complex and there's a lot of interests and objectives associated with the people involved here. Um, so when we did get the charter completed and we got endorsed by the Leadership Council and we took off running, it's like, okay, so why are we here? The first task really given to us um, was to evaluate the current system of monitoring across Puget Sound. It's essentially who's monitoring what and why. And um, in particular, related to the vital sign indicators that the Leadership Council had adopted along with targets to describe our progress towards recovery, the question was, is the monitoring systems that we have in place, are they 
able or sufficient to track the vital sign indicators and targets so that we could responsibly um, answer the question of whether or not we're actually making progress around recovery. So how do you do this? My, just about my least favorite task, uh, trying to compile inventories of existing monitoring. Uh, we started that in 2012, it took a long time. Uh, the reality is that the great majority of that ends up being compiled on documents that look like this. Long, complicated, tedious spreadsheets that take a long time to fill out if they're gonna be accurate and useful and reliable. Um, but we did it, we did it pretty diligently and I think we captured uh, the majority of ongoing funded monitoring programs um, across all the different topic areas and work groups we were working with. Um, uh, a few examples of those were actually um, published as standalone documents. And uh, in one or two cases, we were actually able to use uh, recent publications that had been produced by um, other organizations or partners, in this case, USGS, which had just completed a really very nice and thorough analysis of stream gauging and small streams in the whole basin. And so that contributed um, you know, to, our, to our analysis as well. So the easy part was lining that up with the vital signs. So to answer the sort of simple question, is there enough monitoring to be able to report the vital signs on a reliable basis? Because uh, that's just a simple you know, one to one comparison, more or less. So 12 of the vital signs, um, we at least had data sets available for all of the indicators in those vital signs. Some of the, some of the individual vital signs have multiple indicators, um, but 12 of them all together, uh, you know, we had at least reasonable data we could report. Six of the vital signs were either missing data for individual indicators or had data of such poor quality that, that the reports were really questionable. And, and three of them we had no data at all, including, including things like birds, you know, which we, you'd sort of think, you know, that's a reasonable vital sign to track, it's a reasonable question to ask, and we couldn't come up with any time series data that was reliable to actually report on the indicator or the targets as they were described. So, you know, if you look at the, the two blocks, the six and the, and the three, nine out of 20, um, out of 21 indicators, about a little over 40%, uh, were either missing data, had no data, or had, you know, very unreliable data. So not really a terrific response back to the Leadership Council. Uh, the next step was, okay, well you got the vital signs, but what about the rest of the ecosystem? The vital signs weren't intended to necessarily cover and span the entire extent of all the ecosystem components we were all interested in. So, uh, you know, where are the data gaps for the rest of it? And, um, you know, when I used to feel kind of snarky, I would sort of say, well, it's an ecosystem, right? So if you look at what you're monitoring, everything else is a gap. Um, and that's essentially true, but to try to be a little bit more thoughtful about it, we asked each of the work groups within their topic areas to go back and, um, and describe to us, you know, what their either conceptual framework was or the logic model that they, um, you know, were using to evaluate monitoring gaps and monitoring needs within those topic areas. Um, some, of the, some of the groups used, you know, they focused on um, guiding questions or assessment questions. I mean, people came at this from a variety of ways and there was a lot of discussion, this took a lot of time. And here are just a few examples of models. And, um, and I'll show you like the biogeochemical and the food web perspective here were both, um, both contributions from the Marine Water Work Group and they uh, were probably foremost in pointing out that, you know, you, in some cases you can build ecosystem models or conceptual models from completely different perspectives that are both correct and accurate um, and they don't necessarily describe or lead you to the same results. So you have to be cautious about that. Uh, in some cases, if you just ask, okay, how do you describe monitoring gaps? Uh, there are some cases where you can do that really well. So this is an example, uh, the, the blue bars on the, on the histogram uh, along the x-axis, those are individual watersheds essentially. Um, but the blue bars are uh, a quantitative ranking of the quality of Chinook adult Chinook spawner monitoring in those watersheds. And, um, it, you know, 100 would be really good, 120 would be superlative. Uh, you know, so we're bumping along, you know, and it's not necessarily all that you want, but it's not horrible, right? The red bars uh, are the same quantitative assessment applied to our steelhead monitoring. And you could present that and simply say, well, there's obviously a difference and hence a gap between how well we monitor steelhead and how well, how, how well we monitor Chinook in the same watersheds. So in some cases, you can approach the gap analysis kind of easily that way. Um, and so as we worked through the work groups, we identified a lot of gaps. Um, again, it's an ecosystem. And you know, here's just a partial list. And they're all, they're all reasonable. And they're all, um, 
you know, difficult and in some cases, um, you know, ambitious. And, and essentially, there were just there were really too many gaps. We we identified 150 well-founded, well-documented gaps across all the different topic areas. Um, sitting in the back room today, I think I counted up like 25 gaps that folks had already talked about. Like as they finished their talk and said, "Well, you know, where's the data gap, or what's the information need that we have?" And that's Bellingham Bay, one conference, one group of folks together. Um, so that's kind of right in line. And and the challenge for us was, you know. You look at 150 gaps, and it just it's 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 impossible, right? So where do you start? What do you do with that? Um, so we crafted some strategies. Uh, you know, we were very we were very uh, deliberate about this, and we had some really good ideas and theories about how you prioritize things like monitoring gaps. And in this nice linear process, we were going to bump along, and we were going to you know. Uh, we we're going to evaluate these gaps and we we're going to get them reviewed by the science panel and have the leadership council review them and come up with a funding strategy and all is good. Um, so, uh, spoiler alert, it didn't work that well. Um, we, we kind of assumed that we could also take into account uh, the effectiveness monitoring framework we were developing at the same time. Uh, a lot of you know that under the, you know, the Chinook um, salmon recovery effort, uh, the watersheds are trying to uh, developed these watershed adaptive management and monitoring plans. We knew that that needed to contribute to our, our view or our sense of, of monitoring gaps. The science panel was sponsoring a pressures assessment. We thought that would be important to, to pull in. Uh, all of this has some uh, you know, uh, reverberation back into this, the selection of indicators overall. So you know, we wanted to integrate all these other sort of external efforts as well and come up with this beautiful set of nice prioritized monitoring gaps. Uh, the steering committee debated how you rank this stuff uh, long and hard. Uh, and there was a lot of uh, interest in trying to reduce this big list of 150 down to three or five or at most 10 really high priority gaps. And then we could go to the legislature, go to EPA, or go to somebody and ask for money for those things. Uh, we got a lot of pushback on that. Um, a lot of folks began to realize that it's, it's the extent and breadth of the gaps themselves that's an important point to be made. And if you reduce that whole universe down and just say, well, here's the three things we really think need to be done next, um, you sort of violate that notion that it's a whole ecosystem we have to be concerned with. Um, we actually hired a decision modeling expert to help us create um, a process to identify ranking criteria. And, um, and I'll kind of show you a little bit how that how that went, but again, the early, uh, you know, the, the early result was there was a lot of pushback on that as well. Um, we had a hard time, even with the benefit of a, a person who has, you know, done this for a career, uh, around the decision criteria. Um, they don't, they, they, we just couldn't find some that seemed as absolute as we really needed them to be, and a lot of those turned out to be very contextual. Um, I, I do want to set aside the effectiveness monitoring concerns. There's, that was well recognized as an important gap across all the work that everybody's doing around restoration. Uh, and we sort of set that aside and we said, yeah, we know that. If you, if you try to restore the ecosystem, you want to understand whether you're being effective. Um, so the gaps we're really addressing here and the prioritization we were trying to do is mostly around uh, monitoring for status or trends of ecosystem components. So here's sort of an example. We had this long list of gaps. I mean, imagine. You know, somewhere's around 150 gaps. You know, going down the page there, and we had ranking criteria across the top. And this is one set of ranking criteria that we attempted to use, and we we cho we changed those repeatedly. And um, and long story short, uh, we weren't successful with that, because ultimately, what constitutes a gap depends really on your and what question are you asking. And that was the key problem that tripped us up all the time. And and, and it's important, and that's not trivial. And even though we might think that we've got our model of the ecosystem in our mind, uh, the guy next to us might be thinking about the ecosystem in a different way or with a different framework. And if you're EPA and you're a clean water agency, your priority goals are around clean water. If you're fish and wildlife, your priorities are maybe around setting harvest limits for harvestable species that you're managing. It's, you know, they're kind of really different things. So we, we did go back to the work groups who have the benefit of working at least within a topic area, and we said, all right, so those of you that gave us 10 or 20 or 30 gaps, give us your top five. How, however you best do that, give us your top five gaps. And the resulting list was 56 um, gaps, and we classified them into three policy categories. So those that are directly supporting the vital sign indicators, 
Uh, GAPS has supported one of the partnership's three strategic initiatives that we have, uh, which are articulated around habitat, you know, rest restoring habitat, uh, restoring shellfish beds, or um, uh, improving stormwater management. And then GAPS related to other scientific priorities, and, and we had a number of those that really emerged as, as issues that aren't necessarily being addressed in the action agenda that um, are of you know, pretty big concern to a lot of folks that are working in the system. Uh, ocean acidification is an is a easy example. Um, so here's how it broke out. The gaps for the nine vital signs, the estimated annual cost to fill them would have been around you know, 2.3 million. Uh, for the three strategic initiatives, 21 gaps around stormwater, 24 around habitat, 14 around shellfish, pretty big price tags for each of them. Um, for the other scientific priorities, ocean acidification, and there's a whole Blue Ribbon Commission that's, that's developed monitoring recommendations as part of their work, uh, and PSEM endorsed them. Uh, climate change, food web dynamics, Christopher Krems touched on that, and several of the other speakers have as well. Uh, species status, um, like the ESA listing requirements and, and the monitoring associated with recovering listed species, um, and monitoring just other species that are in decline. Um, just to note, the gaps in costs are not cumulative or additive because you know some of the individual gaps, something like like monitoring stream flows and small streams, uh, might actually touch on more than one of those categories. Uh, but the price tags for all of them were were pretty big. And frankly, those of you that work in monitoring, you generally know that asking for money for monitoring is usually not a popular thing. People want to go right to, can I just build something or do something on the ground, and we'll monitor it later, maybe. Um, so just as part of our communication strategy, we, we wrote up that result, or our results in a white paper. The table on the right is kind of the appendix for it that has all the gaps listed in their categories of whether they contribute to a vital sign or a strategic initiative or some other scientific priority and what the cost estimates would be. Um, but the happy result was that as a result of all this and you know the benefit of kind of doing this over a long period that with, you know, in a deliberate way, with this large group of people who contributed, you know, really serious thought to this whole problem, was the partnership used the result of the analysis to develop a decision package um, at the front end of this budget request season this year, um, and and actually forwarded the 2.7 million dollar request to the governor to fill um, at least the priority monitoring requirements around vital signs and a little bit for effectiveness as well. And it was actually forwarded as the Puget Sound Partnership's highest priority budget request to the governor this year. Um, the governor's office, came, uh, when they released their budget, we were surprised, frankly, but pleased to see that they didn't, they didn't carry forward that entire request, but they, uh, the governor's actually included a $1.04 million uh, request in his proposed biennial budget to the legislature that would fill the gaps in at least six um, of the vital signs that have the worst data sets or, or absent data and would modestly augment um, the effectiveness monitoring effort. Uh, also in the governor's budget was $3 million proposed um, for fish and wildlife to work on toxics in fish, which was a budget um, ad that also directly supports and contributes to Puget Sound toxics and fish vital sign, and that PSEMP had endorsed and the Puget Sound Partnership endorsed as well. So out of all this work that we did, sort of as frustrating as it was, uh, we did result in um, a $4 million budget request being forwarded um, in the governor's budget at least. There's a long ways between the governor's budget and what gets passed this spring. Um, but uh, I would just say that that's, you know, that's kind of the wow moment because I've not seen that happen uh, for general monitoring uh, in, in most really in my career. So I I'm, I'm, was pretty surprised by that. So, that, so there we are. Um, you know, obviously there are dozens of monitoring gaps that remain. And um, you know, I guess one of the things I would say with that is that um, you know, monitoring, the reality is is that monitoring gets funded generally um, you know, in, in some alignment with funding and with statutory mandates. And so if you are, if you're concerned about species recovery, there's funding sources that tend to be aligned with that. If you're, if you're thinking about clean water or water quality or um, salmon recovery, there's funding sources associated with those. And you need to really work those funding sources, um, you know, as well as you can and align those with the monitoring gaps that you have. But the other thing I think that really worked in our favor was, was the more compelling nature of having the partnerships and the commitment across all these variety of agencies to work together on some of these topics. So um, 
All right, so I've only got a few minutes left. And I don't want to take a lot of time, um, but this was the more fun part, maybe. So we have these vital signs, and we report them in the um, in the state of the sound report. And there's you can also find the vital sign this wheel on the partnerships website. And this is an interactive and dynamic um, website. So if you go to it, you can click on any one of the pie segments, and it'll start. You can drill down through this wheel into a whole variety of information, including you know the data the uh, associated maps and graphics and so forth. And again, um, I want to really attribute all of this. Well, okay, so the vital signs, the, the, the indicator is not intended to be necessarily a fine grained way of managing local um, needs, but they reflect the overall recovery goals of the partnership. It's kind of an overall snapshot of the health of the system. Uh, these are things we think we can generally track over time, at least once we get the monitoring in place. And they're generally things that resonate with the public. Um, and, and again, the, remember PSEMP and the partnership, we don't do, or the partnership doesn't do monitoring. The member organizations of PSEMP are the ones that, you know, I want to attribute all of the information that, that's included in there to those, um, to those indicator leads and the member organizations. Um, several of these folks are here today and have already presented information. So I'm just going to flip through these really quickly. Um, all of these are available on the on the Vital Sign website on the Partnerships page. These are all contributed by PSEMP member agencies, and um, all of this represents the. These are all screenshots, if you will, uh, just during the last you know week or so as they put this together from the Vital Sign webpage. So this represents at least the most current data that we have um, on the web, and these are being constantly updated as soon as we can. Um, Freshwater quality index. So here's all the locations that we're reporting across Puget Sound. Uh, I think Marcus actually mentioned that the Nooksack River at Brennan, he had a little bit more recent data that he reported, but uh, it's, near the, it's near the bottom of that list, right? Um, I, and I'm not gonna try to do causal explanations or functional linkages here. I just, I'm just gonna give you these snapshots. Uh, stream flow trends. We've got two stations in, the, uh, in, the, um, in this watershed. The, the one that's showing a long-term decline in flow is uh, Nooksack River at Ferndale, and the uh, one in the group with the, underneath the green arrow is uh, Nooksack River um, below Cascade Creek. Um, I think it's the North Fork. Sorry. So it's a it's a tributary stream higher up in the watershed. Why that one is showing increased flows and the other and the lower station is showing? To, to, I mean, again, I'm not going to try to explain why, but you can kind of see where that lines up against um, watersheds in the rest of Puget Sound. Christopher talked about the Marine Water Quality Index, um, and you have to be careful how you how you interpret this because again, this is, has a lot of influence from uh, ocean cycles and a variety of other factors. But uh, but we're able to you know kind of show how marine water quality varies through Puget Sound by these uh, major basins. This is the rate of shoreline armoring. Um, this is not necessarily the figure that people or the the, the metric that people would most you know, would first think about. This is actually showing, you know, really up in Bellingham Bay that the rate is one of the lowest, like less than 5% um, increase in shoreline armoring between 2005 and 2010. But if you look at this carefully, what you sort of notice is the whole eastern side of Puget Sound, which is the most heavily armored shoreline, has the lowest rate of new shoreline armoring because so much of it's already been armored. And the areas to the west and in central Sound that have the lowest um, current amount of armoring have the highest rate of increase. So um, it's important to look at those trends. It's not the same as the absolute amount, but it's, uh, it's not necessarily where we want to be going either. Uh, changes in eelgrass over time, if you, uh, if you sort of look, um, the gray dots are stable populations of eelgrass that haven't been showing an increase or decline over the period of record here, 2003 to 12. Um, there's a, a little bit in Samish Bay, essentially, that's increasing. Um, or maybe that's Padilla Bay, uh, one site out, uh, I think west of Lummi, this decline, a lot of it's stable. But you see these clusters of declining eelgrass beds sort of in the southern part of the sound and then up around the San Juan Islands. Um, uh, estuarine wetlands restored, this is a figure across the breadth of Puget Sound and there's, you know, this is, this kind of illustrates that there's a, you know, we have a target goal and, um, you know, we're kind of a long ways from reaching you know, the target goal of 7,300 acres. You know, here we are, we're really not, uh, we're really probably not quite on the trajectory we want to get there in cumulative time. But um, you can also find a, a, project, a link to the project atlas on the, uh, through the vital signs and on the partnership webpage. This, this is, these are just dots showing the number of restoration projects 
in place um, geographically. And you can uh, zoom in, you can drill into this local area, you can drill in even finer, you can get down to the individual project site level, you can find and see and look at the record of all the various restoration actions. These are, I think, mostly PSAR funded projects, um, but it gives you some sort of glimpse of how much work is going on and geographically where. Toxics in fish, it's a little more complicated diagram. I'm not gonna take a long time to explain it. Red's bad, green's better. Um, the important thing here really, and this is why the, we so supported the budget request for the toxics in fish. Uh, this is a measure of, of toxics in Pacific herring uh, in 2010. It's kind of one data point, and it's only a, uh, you know four locations. Uh, English sole from 2011, a few more. Adult Chinook salmon and adult coho salmon, one sample in 96 and a sample in 2008, and one sample from juvenile Chinook in 2010. Uh, you know, this is expensive monitoring. Uh, it's, it's, and, and the lab work is excessive, you know, excessively expensive. Um, we don't have enough of that information. And, and, and so this is you know, kind of illustrative of why we need more information and more data. You can also see that um, basically the closer you are to urban centers, uh, the more likely you are to have an issue or problem. Sediment chemistry index, uh, Valerie talked at length about this today and in far better detail than I will. Uh, you know, this is the Bellingham Bay score. She probably mentioned that uh, they are scheduled to be resampled in 2016. The red line, though, is the criteria that we're trying to achieve. So that's not that's not showing, um, you know, some sediment chemistry hits that are vastly higher than the target. Um, you know, but it, but you know, again, we're able to track this and kind of compare this to some other areas. Elliott Bay obviously has um, is not meeting its goal, so it's actually uh, has worse contamination issues. And then just the last couple of slides here. You know, we all know Cherry Point herring are. Um, are a particular concern, and you know we can pull that off from this area. That's pretty clear. Uh, and Chinook and Eric talked at length about Chinook. This is adult returning spawners. Um, these these are the actual abundance numbers, um, the five-year averages um, for both natural origin spawners and natural origin recruits. Um, these actually come from NOAA's A and P tables, uh, this data source, and I'm not going to quibble about you know whether those are exactly accurate. But if you look at the order of magnitude, I mean, this basically indicates there's been no change over the last, you know, five-year period or the ten-year period that we evaluated trends. But um, you know, we're we're counting adult returners in the hundreds, and the recovery goals are in the multiple thousands. So um, that's just illustrative that we're kind of a long ways from where we want to be. And you know, there aren't many populations of Chinooks in Puget Sound that are um, anywhere as close to the recovery goals for them. And then just one last thing, I just want to point out, one of the other products that we're um, actually pretty pleased with in, in, in our PSEMP community is we've been producing um, for three years now these annual reports of observations from, um, uh, from one full year. Uh, this is the report, this is a report we just, um, we actually just got the printed copies out. It's available on our website and has been for a little while. This is really an, an attempt and an effort to pull together um, ongoing data sets of observations, of, of annual observations related to marine water conditions in Puget Sound. But the topic areas span a lot, you know, climate, weather, ocean conditions, river input, seawater, I mean, seawater water quality parameters, phytoplankton, biotoxins. Uh, we're getting additional contributions um, from the birds, mammals, and forage fish work groups. Um, we're going to be kicking off the next edition of this in the next couple of months and bringing people together. This is something to look at and where you have time series that could contribute to this, it's something to contribute to. This is the attempt that we really have that exemplifies our, our effort to, to connect the dots between different data sets to try to explain patterns in a variety of these elements. So. If you're, if you're working on phytoplankton or if you're working on biotoxins and you're working on herring or smelt and you're wondering, you know, what could be the larger um, drivers that are, that, are, that are correlated with some of these changes that I'm seeing, um, this is the opportunity to, to pair some of this information together with climate and weather conditions and ocean conditions and river input. So it's a nice resource. Um, keep your eyes out for it. It's, uh, it's a joint publication between NOAA and uh, uh, monitoring program and um, does a good job of pulling information together from a host of sources. That's all I have, and I think we have a panel after this anyway, right? So hopefully I'm not too far over. So thank you all.
quick time for maybe a question while we have the panelists come up and get ready. Do we have a question maybe or two for Ken? Good. Worry out with bureaucracy. Whoops, not quite. <laughs> Sure. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious about your bird data. You said that there was no data in the vital signs, which kind of surprised me. I know there was the MESA data, and then there's been repeats of the MESA data. So could you explain that more fully? Yeah, so the, the, the way the target was established by the Leadership Council, um, they, they selected, a, actually, um, there was a whole process around trying to develop a, a meaningful index for, um, for birds. So they weren't looking at individual bird populations. I mean, some of those data are available, to, but to do the, the bird index to try to explain um, essentially the um, concerns for bird populations that are more closely associated with, with Puget Sound in particular. And so there was, a lot of, there was a lot of work to be done around, you know, marble murrelets, for example. Are they, you know, you know are they responding to changes in, in marine water? Are they changing, you know, responding to changes in, um, in old growth nesting habitat? Uh, do we really want to count white winged scoters that are only here for a couple months out of their whole life cycle? You know, how do we do that? So, um, so the bird monitor, or the bird work group actually um, worked on producing a, um, a peer reviewed manuscript uh, to develop a bird index, which has now been um, accepted and adopted. Uh, Fish and Wildlife has the data in order to report those indices properly. They need a little bit of money, a little bit of funding to be able to do the analyses to report those against the target. Um, that's one of the um, funding elements that is included in the governor's budget. It's not a lot. I mean, they're not asking for a lot, but we do have that there. The, the problem with bird data is there's, there's, there have been examples like the Mesa data. In fact, early in my career, I was involved in doing one of the review, one of the, one of the re-samples of that work. Um, but there's also some methodological issues, and, and they had to line that up with an index that tried to make more sense that could be interpreted as a snapshot of Puget Sound. So thank you all. You've been watching a presentation from the State of the Bay Symposium held in January 2015 in Bellingham, Washington. If you'd like to see the other six presentations from this symposium, please visit the City of Bellingham's YouTube site www.youtube.com slash city of Beham Wah.